Hi there, it's Stephen and Anne. At breakfast from 6am, you'll always be caught up with everything you need to know. The latest headlines, opinions and debates. We'll bring you the good news and the bad, but most of all, we're here for you. Remember, send in your views and let us know what you would like us to talk about. That's because we're your news channel. And every morning at 6am, it's breakfast on GB News. My name's Tom Harwood and join me 9.30am every weekday for The Briefing, your one-stop shop for everything you need to know about what's going on in politics today. I wonder if this is a deal that might need to be like the biscuits in this factory, twice baked. Is there not an opportunity here to win out against the extremes? Tom Harwood, GB News. What are you going to do about it? Things should have been done differently and they, and they certainly are being done differently. Don't miss it. The Briefing with me, Tom Harwood, 9.30, Monday to Friday on GB News. Where would you like to go? Just take me to the studio, please, mate. You know where you're going. I've got a show to do. Friday Night Feast on GB News, 7pm. And it's like nothing you've ever seen before. We take a different angle on the week's biggest news stories. The viewers and listeners sent me some absolutely mad challenges to do. We tried to rehome a rescue dog. And yes, there's some other wacky stuff in there as well. I feel like I could take on the world. Well, that's that. Friday Night Feast with me, Patrick Christie's, every Friday, 7 till 9pm on GB News. Be there. Hello and welcome to The Briefing, your afternoon fix of all the latest political news, debate and analysis. I'm Arlene Foster and today I'm joined in the studio by political commentator and broadcaster Emma Webb. So here's what's coming up over the next hour. The latest in the Westminster Schlees row as Tory whip Chris Pincher resigned from his post last night after it emerged he had drunkenly groped two male colleagues on Wednesday evening. I'll speak to a victim of the IRA's Dockland bombing about legal action probing alleged links between Gerry Adams and the mainland IRA attacks. With 25 years since the Hong Kong rule was handed over from Britain to China, I'll speak to two campaigners about the territory's political legacy. As Nicola Sturgeon prepares to put Scotland into more constitutional chaos, we'll be asking, is her plans for a referendum even legal? And I'll speak to a disability advocate about raising awareness for people with disabilities. But as ever, give me your political briefing. Send in your views and opinions by emailing gbviews at gbnews.uk or tweet me at gbnews. But first, here's the news with Rihanna. Thank you, Ali, and good afternoon. It's one minute past three. Your top stories from the GB newsroom. Two Tory MPs have written to the Chief Whip calling for Chris Pincher to be removed from the party. It comes after he quit his role as Deputy Chief Whip following a drunken incident on Wednesday evening. Are you drowning in sleeves? We suspend Chris Pincher. Boris Johnson was quizzed on the scandal as he welcomed the New Zealand Prime Minister this afternoon. A Downing Street spokesperson says Mr Johnson believes the matter is over. Conservatives Karen Bradley and Caroline Noakes are calling for a zero-tolerance policy on sexual misconduct. Shadow Justice Minister Ellie Reeves told GB News this is just the latest in a string of incidents. This is a Conservative government completely mired by sleaze and it just isn't good enough. Standards in public life have got to be higher than this and Boris Johnson has got to get a grip of it. Well, Secretary of State for Wales Simon Hart told GB News it shouldn't be used as a party political issue. First reaction with all of this is always one of you know, sadness, sometimes really rather than anger, because so many people are affected by this. Clearly, massive misjudgments uh, uh, appear on the face of it to have been, uh, to have been made. And, and uh, you know, I think our first priority, rather than turning this into a sort of party political uh, discussion, which, which it sounded almost dangerously like it was about to be, uh, that we look after the interests of people who've been adversely affected by this. They must be and will remain our absolute first priority. GB News understands UK authorities have plans in place for the possible return of a convicted jihadist and alleged member of the so-called Islamic State group. 
Ayn Davis, part of the execution squad known as the Beatles, could be deported within weeks as he nears the end of his prison sentence in Turkey. Davis from West London was sentenced to seven and a half years in 2017 for terrorism offences. According to reports, Turkish officials say he's scheduled to be released on July the 9th but could be arrested and face criminal investigations when he returns. COVID infections in the UK have gone up by 32% in a week, according to the Office for National Statistics. The latest figures show 2.3 million cases were recorded, up by more than half a million from the week before. It's the highest estimate since late April, and hospital admissions are also going up. UK manufacturing growth reached a two-year low last month. The latest industry research shows it slowed between May and June, making it the lowest since the COVID pandemic. Industry leaders have blamed the slowdown on the war in Ukraine, Brexit, plus travel and supply chain disruptions. Russian missile strikes have killed at least 19 people in the Ukrainian port city of Odessa. Officials say residential buildings and two holiday camps were destroyed in the overnight attacks. Over 30 people are understood to have been injured. The Kremlin has denied targeting civilians. In his daily address, Ukraine's President Volodymyr Zelensky said Moscow's still focusing its firepower in the east of the country. Police have warned that lives could be put at risk if protests go ahead at the British Formula One Grand Prix this weekend. Northamptonshire police say they've received credible intelligence that a group are planning to invade the track on race day. A record crowd of 142,000 are expected at Silverstone on Sunday. Local authorities fear the event could be disrupted. Police Scotland officers are to withdraw their goodwill in a dispute over pay. Although they're banned by law from striking, the move's being called the most overt demonstration of action by police in Scotland in over a century. From five o'clock this afternoon, off-duty officers won't take radio equipment home with them, nor will they start their shifts early. And nurses and pharmacists will now be able to certify sick notes. The move is part of plans to help alleviate pressure on NHS GPs. Other health professionals, including physiotherapists, can also issue the documents, which are now called fit notes. The new changes cover England, Scotland and Wales, with Northern Ireland expected to follow suit. This is GB News. We'll bring you more as it happens now, though. It's back to Arlene with the briefing. So welcome to the briefing. It's just six minutes past three o'clock in the afternoon. Tory Deputy Chief Whip Chris Pincher has resigned from the government after allegations that he groped two men at a private members club. In his resignation letter, he told the Prime Minister that he drank far too much and embarrassed myself and other people. Well, joining me now from Westminster is GB News reporter Paul Hawkins. Paul, perhaps you could bring everybody up to date with this story. Yeah, so this is uh, Chris Pincher, a uh, Conservative MP who resigned from the government last night. He was uh, the deputy chief, uh, sorry, the deputy whip for the uh, for the party. Essentially, his job was to get other Conservative uh, MPs to vote with the party line, and he resigned um, following allegations printed in a newspaper that he groped two men uh, and was seen drunk in a me private members' bar in uh, London. Uh, the uh, the Prime Minister has accepted his resignation, and the line that Number Ten is holding is that. Uh, Chris Pincher has accepted wrongdoing. Uh, he's resigned from the government. He is still a Conservative MP and that that is the end of the matter. That is the line that uh, Number 10 is holding. But th there is unhappiness with that line uh, from Labour, uh, but also from within the Conservative Party as well. Two senior female Conservative MPs, Caroline Noakes and Karen Bradley, have written to the Chief Whip's office saying that there needs to be a zero tolerance approach to sexual misconduct allegations. And that also uh, that the uh, party's recent approach to allegations, says the letter, 
uh, uh, pose a risk of serious reputational damage. The way the party deals with these kind of allegations is not good. Now, they're referring to uh, examples such as in mid-May when a Conservative MP was arrested on suspicion of a string of uh, sexual misconduct allegations and the party decided to tell him to stay away from Parliament, but they didn't withdraw the whip from him, i.e. when we talk about withdrawing the whip away from him, we mean that uh, he's, can still, he's still a member of the Conservative Party and indeed that MP took part in the no confidence vote in the uh, Prime Minister. Now, Simon Hart, Cabinet Minister, was asked this morning by the media whether, there should, uh, whether the whip should be withdrawn from Chris Pincher. Let me just read you his answer because it is very interesting. He said, I know what I'd like to see happen. You can probably tell what that is just from the way I'm trying to avoid answering the question. Paul from uh, Westminster Downing Street there. Thank you very much for joining us. And I'm going to come to this issue with uh, my guest, Emma. Emma, this is yet another Friday that we're talking about these sorts of allegations. This is a wider culture at Westminster. And what are we going to do about it? If, if this had been just a single incident, mm. then we could have set it aside from the bigger picture. Mm. But the fact that this keeps happening repeatedly, that we keep seeing these scandals, we've seen, um, you know, M the scandal around MPs looking at the MP who looked at porn in Parliament. Um, we've seen a number of scandals that are related to what is being described as Tory sleaze mm. or Pestminster in this mm. case. Um, and it seems that there is something fundamentally wrong within the Conservative Party. The fact that this um, is also coming out, you know, just after the um, two by-elections where the yeah. Conservatives performed um, dramatically poorly, uh, I think is the... I mean, I can think of worse ways to describe it. I think there will be many people within the Conservative Party who are looking at the leadership and thinking, what on earth is going on and other MPs I in, in many ways I feel sorry for those MPs particularly those in marginal seats mm -hmm. who um, are going to suffer the consequences of this and it's not just about the leadership either it's also about the way that ways that conservative MPs are choosing to conduct themselves the the excuse and or the reasoning that it was because um, he was drunk and therefore he embarrassed himself you would think that under the circumstances there would be no MP who would even think to get drunk in public um, and even if you are drunk it doesn't excuse that kind of behaviour. So I think um, that there will be many members of the party, many people who are not necessarily members but voted for the Conservatives yeah. in 2019, and it's a point that Sherelle Jacobs has made um, from The Telegraph the, the, uh, to, on Twitter today that um, the results, the consequences of this for the results of the next gen general election could possibly be that, as with the Liberals 100 years ago, that the Conservative Party just gets completely decimated. Well, I mean, this man was a deputy whip... Uh, this is a person, mm -hmm. um, for our listeners and viewers, who is meant to enforce discipline. He's meant to see that the members um, don't step out of line. And yet here he was at a private members club, uh, apparently so drunk that he could barely stand up. Uh, and he's in charge of discipline. I think whether this is um, true or not, the perception that the public will have of this is that as with Partygate, that mm. this is a, a problem that really goes to the very, very top and the very, very heart of the Conservative Party, that, you know, if we see those people who are in charge of ethics making mm. um, grave errors in their moral judgment, if we see people um, like the chief uh, deputy chief whip mm -hmm. um, behaving in a way that is absolutely not a model of the behavior that the conservative mp should emulate um, it suggests something is is extremely wrong at the heart of the conservative party and as i said that it's the the fact that this is you know repeated incidents of scandal mm. um, and that that comes alongside what looks like uh, the conservative party being completely unmoored from conservative principles and sort of rattling away like a train that is out of control um, and pursuing policies that are fundamentally unconservative. It just suggests that the whole party is in complete disarray. And what's worse is that Boris Johnson's comments um, repeatedly suggest that he is increasingly out of touch with the way that this is perceived by the public. And obviously two of his female, quite senior female uh, colleagues feel the same. Caroline Noakes, Karen Bradley mm -hmm. have written to him today to say there has to be zero tolerance in relation 
to these sorts of activities? I mean, what do you think the response will be? Because I have to say, right across the country, I would imagine Conservative members are saying, yes, that's absolutely right. Yeah, so the, the Conservative Party's policy is not to withdraw the whip unless mm. some kind of criminal charge is brought against one of their MPs. Mm. Um, so they will probably be wanting to uphold that, yes, that yes. principle. Um, and I think that it's absolutely right that people should be, um, you, you know, um, innocent until proven mm. guilty. But the consequences of this, the consequences of not being seen to take this seriously for the Conservative Party at this critical point, mm. when they're doing so badly in the polls, when Boris Johnson and even you know other leadership contenders like Rishi Sunak are doing so badly in the polls, um, and with all of the other things taken into account, I think that this is going to play very, very badly with the British public, and that um, if they don't sort themselves out soon, there will be no hope for the next general election. Emma, for now, thank you. We're going to move on to another story, a pretty huge story, which emerged at the weekend with former Sinn Féin president Jerry Adams facing legal action as three IRA victims are suing him over allegedly masterminding the 1996 Manchester and London Dockland bombings alongside the 1973 Old Bailey car bomb attack. Of course, Jerry Adams rejects all of these allegations, but I'm delighted to say that joining me now is the victim of the IRA and uh, president of the Docklands Victims Association, Jonathan Ganesh. Jonathan, thank you so much uh, for joining me this afternoon. Perhaps, Jonathan, just for our listeners and viewers, uh, you could tell us about uh, that awful bomb that, unfortunately, you were caught up in in 1996. Yeah, good afternoon, Arlene. Um, is, is I'd be happy to. Um, I was uh, working as a part-time security officer uh, in the Docklands, working my way through college, and um, there was a, a massive terrorist bomb um, which killed my two friends, and it's something I, I will never forget. I mean, I, it still haunts me to the, this day, but, but there's many other people in the Docklands and other people throughout Northern Ireland, um, mainland UK, who suffered very similar experiences. It's a, it's a, I was left with burnt, uh, scars, I damaged my hand, and uh, my, more importantly to me, my two friends in Bashir and John Jeffries, who ran the local newspaper kiosk uh, selling sweets and uh, to children. They were actually uh, very, they were actually killed and very badly, and their bodies were extremely badly damaged. And the memories and the experience of that, Jonathan, are so very clearly with you. And I want to thank you for coming on today because I know sometimes it's difficult to recall uh, what happened in these terrorist uh, attacks. Um, but you've decided, uh, along with two others, um, to take this case. It's a little bit unusual, though, because you're not actually seeking monetary compensation, are you? Tell, tell us about that. This, this was a, a we 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 had we, did, we discussed this actually with our legal team and victims in all victims in Northern Ireland as well as victims in the mainland UK within our DVA the Doctors Victim Association. It was very important as a principle that we did not sue for monetary damages. Although I believe those people would be entitled because they've got severe injuries, mm. would be entitled for comp uh, compensation. However, in principle, we 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 are, are suing for the amount of one pound uh, because we felt as though we didn't want any any person to think, well, it may be, oh, it's, it's about money. It's not about money. It's about principle. It's about uh, bringing some sort of closure to, to the victim. I know I know. initially it, it's it's a Docklands Manchester and the Old Bailey. However, it's symbolic, mm. not just of the, the, the attacks in mainland UK, and we must remember that Northern Ireland did suffer uh, immensely. They, they certainly endured more than their fair share. So it's really for everybody who suffered uh, due to IRA uh, to terrorism. So as I understand it, Jonathan, the first um, um, part of this case, it, it's a 1973 uh, bomb attack. That's the first bomb on the mainland. And then the Docklands one, the one that you were caught up on uh, was the last big uh, bomb attack. Uh, and so you're covering that whole breadth uh, here uh, on the mainland. And really, what is the aim of bringing Gerry Adams uh, in front of a court of law? What, what do you hope to achieve by doing that? Well, we're, we're hoping to achieve closure 
Um, as you I don't know, uh, you may be aware, uh, that the government is trying to impose legislation and laws that will actually prevent any person on either side, maybe it be the IRA, maybe it be the UVF or any paramilitary that was involved in terrorism uh, that originated from Northern Ireland and in Northern Ireland, they could not face civil or criminal prosecutions. And we felt we had to, although we've, we've protested to the government, and I've met Northern Ireland officials on this, and I've from, from Northern Ireland office, and I've met many, talked, uh, written to many MPs. However, I felt as though the government may just bulldoze this policy through and we felt it was important to make sure that we 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 i mean jerry adams is an alleged major uh player within the ira and many people have actually said that even people who actually admitted they were in the ira but these, these are allegations that i do feel that he he can answer and maybe finally put uh some sort of closure for the for the victims so this may well, because of the legislation uh, that's actually in the House of Commons at this present moment in time, Jonathan, this may be the last big chance uh, to have this civil case uh, taken uh, because you've already lodged the papers before the legislation uh, takes effect. Uh, and I know uh, that you uh, are looking for assistance in terms of crowdfunding. Do you want to tell our listeners and viewers about how they can uh, contribute to what you're trying to achieve, in other words, to try and get closure, to try and get um, a full account of what happened? Uh, uh, well, you know, we, we launched the trial funding page um, because we won't, we won't get legal aid for this case. And obviously, uh, we, we have to pay certain court fees and, also, and, and, and other expenses. Um, so if, if people could help us in any way. But what surprised me, Arlene, was when we launched the, 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 the GoFunding, the, 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 the crowdfunding uh, page, we, we were astonished by the generosity of people because and within hours we, we received um, um, amazing donations uh, uh, and emails from Northern Ireland as well as mainland UK really really getting behind this and really supporting us. And that was very touching. With all due respect, Arlene, some of these people, God bless them, they, they probably can't afford to send money, yeah. but they yeah. do because, because they care. And, 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 and it meant a lot to me. It just gave us the, it gave us some sort of, um, you know, to go forward and, and, and gave us that renewed confidence that we were doing the right thing. And, 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 we, we, it's, and, and we must remember terrorism, as you know from your experience, what happened to you, your 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 dad, and and what happened to you, and what other people of terrorism is 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 one of the worst atrocities in humanity, and any justification for that, and we must remember now we've got terrorist groups in in Somalia, Al Shabab, uh, Nigeria, the Boko Haram, and and if we justify terrorism in any way, there's nothing wrong in people saying no one's trying to jeopardize any peace process. Believe you me, we're not. We promote the peace process, but it's not. It's nothing wrong in saying to people, "Terrorism is wrong." To us, there is no freedom fighters. There's yeah. a democracy, and we mu we must use every uh, within the law to change government policy or change uh, uh, certain things in society uh, the right way, not to kill innocent children. Uh, uh, or innocent people, this, this this is wrong, and and our case goes deeper to send the message to to every terrorist around the world that listen, you will be held to account. Because one of the worst fears would be somebody might say, well, look at what they, well, look at what they've done to look what they've done. They've given some kind of an amnesty. It, it should be called an amnesty. All intents and purposes, it may be an amnesty. So does that mean in ten years, twenty years time, somebody who killed poor Alan Henning, um, somebody will say, well, we deserve an amnesty too? Yeah. Yeah, well, look, Jonathan, I, I want to say to you all the very best and uh, I wish you all the very best. And if anybody wants to contribute, that crowdfunding uh, page is available uh, if you Google it. And certainly if you contact me here at GB News, I can give you the details of it as well. But I want to say a huge thank you to Jonathan for coming on to discuss that very important case. Coming up next, however, we will be discussing the anniversary of the UK handing Hong Kong back to China. But before that, let's take a short break.
We are GB News. We're right across this great nation. On TV. On radio. On digital. Absolutely everywhere. We don't talk down to you. We embrace all voices with honest, uncivilised conversation. We are not part of the establishment. We are one of you. And we're only getting started. Join us on GB News, the People's Channel. Britain's News Channel. Hi there, it's Stephen and Anne. At breakfast from 6am, you'll always be caught up with everything you need to know. The latest headlines, opinions and debates. We'll bring you the good news and the bad, but most of all, we're here for you. Remember, send in your views and let us know what you would like us to talk about. That's because we're your news channel. And every morning at 6am, it's breakfast on GB News. My name's Tom Harwood and join me 9.30am every weekday for The Briefing, your one-stop shop for everything you need to know about what's going on in politics today. I wonder if this is a deal that might need to be like the biscuits in this factory, twice baked. Is there not an opportunity here to win out against the extremes? Tom Harwood, GB News. What are you going to do about it? Things should have been done differently and they, and they certainly are being done differently. Don't miss it. The Briefing with me, Tom Harwood, 9.30, Monday to Friday on GB News. Where would you like to go? Just take me to the studio, please, mate. You know where you're going. I've got a show to do. Friday Night Feast on GB News, 7pm. And it's like nothing you've ever seen before. We take a different angle on the week's biggest news stories. The viewers and listeners sent me some absolutely mad challenges to do. We tried to rehome a rescue dog. And yes, there's some other wacky stuff in there as well. I feel like I could take on the world. Well, that's that. Friday Night Feast with me, Patrick Christie's, every Friday, 7 till 9pm on GB News. Be there. Join me, Darren Grimes, for Real Britain every Saturday and Sunday from 2pm. A news hour that comes with a trigger warning. Scorching hot opinion with prominent guests saying the unsayable and a little bit of weekend fun thrown in. Unlike other broadcasters, I won't be forgetting what the B in our name stands for. So how are you in for Real Britain Saturday and Sunday from 2pm? Hello, I'm Patrick Christie's. And I'm Mercy Moroki. Make sure that you join us Monday to Thursday, 10 a.m. until midday, right here on GB News for To The Point. We're not afraid to talk about the topics that matter to you or the big topics that always matter. We cover absolutely everything from the breaking political stories of the day to law and order, what's going on in the channel. We're not afraid to hold people to account. We always make sure we include your views on our show. Indeed, if you're thinking it, you can guarantee that we're saying it. So make sure you join the conversation with us 10 a.m. until midday, Monday to Thursday, for To The Point on GB News. Welcome back to the briefing. So China's one country, two systems model of ruling Hong Kong has worked in protecting the city and must continue long term, says President Xi. The Chinese leader mounted a stern defence of the political system in a speech in Hong Kong following recent international criticism. Hong Kong is marking 25 years since Britain returned the territory to China. And joining me now to talk about all of this is Benedict Rogers, who's the co-founder of Hong Kong Watch, and Nathan Law, who is a Hong Kong activist and former member of the Legislative Council, now exiled here in uh, London. Thank you both very much uh, for joining me. I'll go to you first, Benedict, and ask you what your reaction is to President Xi's comments today. Well, I, my reaction is that uh, it, it's completely at odds with the truth and with reality. In fact, it's the exact opposite. Uh, what he has done ha has been to completely tear up one country, two systems, to tear up the promises made under the Sino-British Joint Declaration, to tear up Hong Kong's freedoms and autonomy. And Hong Kong basically is one country, two systems in name still, but in reality, it's, uh, it's under the direct rule of Beijing. And, and Nathan, uh, um, given your background and what you've had to do to protect yourself, I would assume that you'd very strongly agree with that. Um, yes, definitely. One country, two system for now is a lie. Um, it was supposed to give Hong Kong the promises of democracy, autonomy and freedom. Um, but for now, what we've seen is uh, large amounts of political campaigners are in jail. Um, public rally are an, impossible to host now. And also, um, civil society is being cracked down. Our independent unions, news outlets, 
and all sorts of political organization are forced to disband. So um, to conclude, uh, for now, 25 years of one country, two system is just um, giving an opportunity to China to direct rule uh, in Hong Kong and destroy our way of life. And in terms of uh, our viewers and listeners, I think they'd be very interested to hear again about the law that was passed recently that only patriots, in inverted commas, can stand for election in Hong Kong's territory. Just explain that uh, to our viewers and listeners, if you don't mind, Nathan. Um, Beijing introduced a new concept um, of comprehensive jurisdiction in Hong Kong, which it entails several parts. Uh, one of them is an election overhaul that um, only patriots, quote unquote, can run um, in legislative council election, and uh, the candidates has to be vetted by political police, uh, which means that the pro-democracy camp has no room for meaning meaningful participation. And for now, our city's leader, chief executive, is basically uh, being selected by um, an election committee um, only composed by Beijing loyalists. Mm. Um, so for now, there's no democratic elements in any of our election system. And uh, Hong Kong people are basically being betrayed. And Benedict, I mean, what more can we here in the UK do around all of this? I've noticed the comments of our foreign secretary today saying she won't sleep until this is sorted out and all of this sort of thing. But what more can we do here? Uh, because it is really an outrage that this is happening in Hong Kong. Absolutely. I mean, the foreign secretary's uh, statement and also the prime minister's uh, statement are very welcome, but they need to need to be uh, matched with with action. And so far, what the UK has done uh, has been a very generous scheme to allow Hong Kongers uh, to come to the UK to to find freedom, to escape from the city, and that's very welcome. But they've done nothing to hold the Chinese regime to account for breaking an international treaty and for breaking its promises. So the one thing that I think the British government uh, can and should do now, along with allies, is to impose sanctions. Because if the regime uh, is allowed to get away with doing what it's done with no penalty, with no price to pay, with, with impunity, then it's just going to be emboldened to continue the repression at home, but also increase its aggression abroad. And Nathan, finally, if I can ask you, you've obviously still got friends and colleagues. I'm assuming you still have friends and colleagues living in Hong Kong. Today is a holiday, but to me it looks like very much a very tight security holiday today. Have you been speaking to any of them as to how they feel about today? Many of my friends have expressed desperation, anger and discontent online. Uh, it is not a day for them to celebrate. Yeah. Many sees the date of Hanover as a tragic day that they mourn for their city. So um, for now, that's pretty much a reflection of how Hong Kong people are disappointed to one country, two system, and also wanted uh, freedoms and democracy to be implemented in their own city. Yeah, absolutely. Well, Benedict and Nathan, thank you so much for joining me this afternoon to allow our viewers and listeners to get up to date with what's happening uh, in Hong Kong. Let's bring in today's guest, Emma. I mean, for me, looking at what's happening in Hong Kong and bearing in mind it was us in the UK that handed back Hong Kong to China, should we not be doing more? Thank you so I, much. Thanks. I think, I think we should be doing more. I think the question is what we can do. So Benedict touched on this. Yes. That, um, if, yes, we can have the Foreign Secretary and the Prime Minister making lots of... Great comments. And I think statements about are this. important. They are important. They are, but I think that the problem is that we've made a mockery of that international treaty because mm. we have failed to enforce it. We mm. we see China um, doing this kind of uh, communist doublespeak, yes. where they they say they are upholding the um, one country two systems when we know that they're not. We say that they are setting. They say that they are setting uh, China on this path towards a democracy and prosperity. We know that they're. Doing doing the opposite. Yeah. Um, and so I think that th the issue is that it's not clear to us because of the geopolitical balance of power how we respond to China. I think we ought to be doing more to try and yeah. enforce that treaty. Um, but ultimately, we've al already in many ways undermined ourselves yeah. and, and in, in some ways that ship has sailed. And just allowing Hong Kongers to come to the United Kingdom is not a solution yeah. because we failed to protect their homeland as we promised. Yeah. It is, it is pretty depressing stuff, I have to say, but hopefully uh, our allies and ourselves can come together to do something uh, in Hong Kong. Um, 
But we're now going to go uh, to the news uh, with Rhiannon and we'll speak about Nicola Sturgeon and her plans to hold a second referendum in 2023. And we're also uh, going to be speaking to Liam Kerr uh, about that. But here's the news now with Rhiannon. Thank you, Arlene. Your top stories from the GB newsroom at 3.32. Two Tory MPs have written to the Chief Whip calling for Chris Pincher to be removed from the party. It comes after he quit his role as Deputy Chief Whip following a drunken incident on Wednesday evening. Are you drowning in sleeves? We suspend Chris Pincher. Boris Johnson was quizzed on the scandal as he welcomed the New Zealand Prime Minister to Downing Street. A number 10 spokesperson says Mr Johnson believes the matter is over. However, Karen Bradley and Caroline Noakes, the only two Conservative female chairs of the select committees, are calling for a zero-tolerance policy on sexual misconduct. GB News understands UK authorities have plans in place for the possible return of a convicted jihadist and alleged member of the so-called Islamic State group. According to reports, Turkish officials say Ain Davis from West London could be deported within weeks. He was jailed in 2017 for terrorism offences and was a member of the execution squad known as the Beatles. COVID infections in the UK have gone up by 32% in a week, according to the Office for National Statistics. The latest figures show 2.3 million cases were recorded, up by more than half a million from the week before. It's the highest estimate since late April, with hospital admissions also on the rise. And police have warned that lives could be put at risk if protests go ahead at the British Formula One Grand Prix this weekend. Northamptonshire police say they've received credible intelligence that a group's planning to invade the track on race day. A record crowd of 142,000 are expected at Silverstone on Sunday. TV Online and DAB Plus Radio, this is GB News. Direct Bullion sponsors the Finance Report on GB News for gold and silver investment. Here's a quick snapshot of today's markets. The pound will buy you 1.199 US dollars and 1.155 euros. The price of gold currently stands at 1,499 pounds and 58 pence per ounce. Direct Bullion sponsors the Finance Report on GB News for gold and silver investment. We are GB News. We're right across this great nation. On TV. On radio. On digital. Absolutely everywhere. We don't talk down to you. We embrace all voices with honest and civilised conversation. We are not part of the establishment. We are one of you. And we're only getting started. Join us on GB News. The People's Channel. Britain's News Channel. Hi there, it's Stephen and Anne. At breakfast from 6am, you'll always be caught up with everything you need to know. The latest headlines, opinions and debates. We'll bring you the good news and the bad, but most of all, we're here for you. Remember, send in your views and let us know what you would like us to talk about. That's because we're your news channel. And every morning at 6am, it's breakfast on GB News. My name's Tom Harwood and join me 9.30am every weekday for The Briefing, your one-stop shop for everything you need to know about what's going on in politics today. I wonder if this is a deal that might need to be like the biscuits in this factory, twice baked. Is there not an opportunity here to win out against the extremes? Tom Harwood, GB News. What are you going to do about it? Things should have been done differently and they, and they certainly are being done differently. Don't miss it. The Briefing with me, Tom Harwood, 9.30 Monday to Friday on GB News. Where would you like to go? Just take me to the studio, please, mate. You know where you're going. I've got a show to do. Friday Night Feast on GB News, 7pm. And it's like nothing you've ever seen before. We take a different angle on the week's biggest news stories. The viewers and listeners sent me some absolutely mad challenges to do. We tried to rehome a rescue dog. And yes, there's some other wacky stuff in there as well. I feel like I could take on the world. Well, that's that. Friday Night Feast with me, Patrick Christie's, every Friday, 7 till 9pm on GB News. Be there.
Welcome back to the programme. Well, in Scotland, Nicola Sturgeon's plans for Indie Ref 2 are already being branded as Pretendy ref by critics. Yesterday, the First Minister promised a consultative referendum will take place on the 23rd of October next year. And consultative referendum would mean that the actual outcome of the vote could not be implemented unless it gained approval from the UK Supreme Court. So is this vote just a ploy to keep the First Minister's base happy? Well, joining me now is Con Scottish Conservative MSP Liam McCair. So, Liam, good to see you. Uh, Let's be honest, this isn't really uh, a referendum, is it? Uh, no, it's not, Arlene, and uh, it's great to be back on your show. It's good to see you again. Um, you described it in your setup there as a pretendy ref. I saw actually the spectator this morning calling it a stunt, and I think yeah. that's what it is. Uh, I mean, leaving aside you know, that we had a, a huge democratic vote in 2014, which returned overwhelmingly. Uh, a, a verdict of we want to stay part of the UK, uh, that hasn't changed. And the fact is the people don't want another referendum up here. They don't want to come out of the United Kingdom. And actually what we must be doing is focusing on the things that matter. Because let's be clear about this. What Nicola Sturgeon and the SNP are trying to do is distract from their dismal record on running public services. So we have uh, huge NHS waiting lists. We have uh, an attainment gap, which is really concerning a lot of people. We have a, a ferries fiasco. We have our trains are a fiasco at the moment uh, since the Scottish government took over. We have violent crime, the highest in a decade. Uh, we have, uh, I think, a quarter of criminals over the last five years have dodged going to court at all. So that's what's going on here. And we think that what we must be focused on it's the things that matter to people, like our public services, not, as you called it quite rightly, a pretendy ref. So, Liam, let's talk about one of those issues, and you've mentioned it there, and um, let's talk about education. And the fact is, in Scotland, uh, you spend 7% more um, on education than in England, uh, and yet that attainment gap has grown exponentially. Uh, and that's just one area. So... Why isn't the First Minister being held to account on issues like that? And instead, what we're talking about today is an independence referendum, which it appears uh, Scotland voters don't want. You're absolutely right, Arlene. Uh, and uh, let me be clear, we are holding her to account. The opposition parties in Scotland are desperately trying to ensure that the agenda is entirely focused on the things that matter, like the attainment gap that you just brought up. Unfortunately, because of this uh, SNP Green Coalition of Chaos that we have up in Scotland, uh, they are deciding to distract from the things like the attainment gap, the NHS waiting list, the violent crime rising, uh, by throwing in this, uh, this pretendy ref stunt, as we were talking about. Yeah, and I mean, there are a few certainties in life, but um, one of the certainties is that no matter what political event happens, it's used by Republicans and nationalists, whether in Scotland or in Northern Ireland, to say, and that is why we have to have an independent Scotland or a united Ireland. I mean, I read somewhere the other day that one of the reasons that was being used is the pandemic. Because of the pandemic and the way in which it was being handled, uh, that we needed an independent Scotland. I would have thought, given the fact that we had access to a vaccine across the UK in the way that we had, it would have been one of the reasons we would use to stay within the union. Well, absolutely. I mean, the, the union has proved quite how successful it has been during the pandemic in terms of the vaccine, uh, in terms of the furlough scheme. But again, your point was absolutely right, Arlene. Uh, you know, we had First Minister's questions yesterday and the, the leaders of the Scottish Conservatives, leaders of Scottish Labour brought up uh, the police, the situation we have in the police with uh, our police are taking the uh, industrial action at the moment with the biggest work to rule for, I think, about a century. Uh, we brought up the cancer waiting times in Scotland. And every single time the First Minister plays it back to somehow blame the UK, to blame Westminster. And I think this is the thing. People are seeing through this tactic of hers now. They're seeing through that it doesn't matter what the failures of her dismal coalition up in Scotland, that everything will be played back to somehow blame it on Westminster. People see through that. She's taking the people of Scotland for fools and they won't accept it. 
And uh, just finally, Liam, I don't know whether you noticed today, but it appears that uh, Kate Forbes, who's the finance minister for the SNP, uh, is aghast at the fact that uh, money has been sent to Ukraine and aid has been sent to Ukraine, uh, and she wants to object to that. I mean, what's your thoughts about that today? I think that the Scottish government would be uh, far better focused on looking at why they're putting £20 million, £20 million, mind, into this pretend ref campaign and why they have assigned 20 civil servants specifically within the civil service to draw up the case for separation. I think that's an appalling dereliction of duty and an appalling waste of money. And I think Kate Forbes would be far better spending her time looking at that rather than perfectly uh, appropriate measures elsewhere. Yeah. Liam, thanks for joining us. Hope to have you back soon. Uh, and we'll talk about some of those other issues uh, in Scotland as opposed to the pretend ref. So let's bring in today's panellist, Emma Webb. Well, we're not surprised that Nicola has gone down this road because, of course, it is a huge distraction to everything else that's happening in Scotland. It is, and in many ways it's, it's almost classic socialism to focus mm. on one thing as being the solution to all problems. Everything has you know, to blame uh, is, is blamed on uh, the United Kingdom and, and Scotland's being a part of it. And I thought it was a really quite laughable and remarkable that she said that the, the UK government wasn't respecting um, the, the democracy of the Scottish people when actually it's, it's Nicola Sturgeon who is the person who has chosen to ignore a democratic result of the referendum in 2014 by pursuing yet another referendum. Um, so I think that this is a distraction. I think that the, that the, the Scottish government have shown, the SNP have shown, that they are not fit to lead an independent Scotland because they can't get even education, as you mentioned, under mm. control. Mm. Um, and so they, they use every opportunity to both blame uh, the UK and also to try and uh, leverage power to get more devolved powers to Scotland over things like, for example, justice. Mm. Um, and they've shown themselves in many respects, um, whether it's to do with uh, hate crime legislation or uh, controlling people's speech, trying to control people's thoughts in many ways, um, that the, the SNP are absolutely not fit to lead. Um, and that it's it, it, in many ways, it would probably shore up their leadership long term if they can continue to blame England for everything. Yeah, absolutely. And, and yet, no answers to huge questions on things like currency, mm -hmm. on pensions, on the deficit, on, on the fact that defence, how is that going to work uh, in an independent Scotland? Uh, and of course, uh, if they were an independent Scotland, would they have a hard border with England? Because of course, we know that the trade that goes across the border between England and Scotland is, is very wide. And the irony, of course, again, that the criticisms that the Scottish Government, the SNP and Nicola Sturgeon make of Brexit, that these are things that were not very well thought through. Mm. Um, as you said about with you know with education and with many other policies, the SNP need to get their own house in order. They need to show that they can actually um, govern well with the limited powers that they have if they want to prove to the Scottish people and to the United Kingdom as a whole that they're ready to have the stabilisers taken off. But what they've shown is that they're not even capable of riding the bike with the stabilisers on. <laughs> Thanks, uh, Emma. But we're going to go now to a little package. Yesterday, our political correspondent Tom Harwood sat down uh, for a national exclusive with Brexit Opportunities Minister Jacob Rees-Mogg. And they look at the government's response to inflation, the cost of living crisis and the other major issues affecting the UK. OK, let's take a little listen. This is interesting because it's not something that many of your colleagues in the Cabinet have articulated in terms of how to deal with the causes of inflation. We hear so much about how the government is dealing with the consequences of inflation. But when, when it comes to those causes, uh, it, it, the government hasn't really been saying that it does want fiscal tightening. It is fundamental to understand the causes because, bear in mind, inflation hits the least well-off in society the hardest. It hits the elderly on fixed incomes, and it hits the young who are just starting on their careers, who don't have a rapidly growing income. And this is really important that we tackle the causes of inflation. And this is doing things that are difficult to do. I mean, increasing interest rates is hard for people. Um, tightening fiscal policy is hard for people. Therefore, we need to go further and faster with supply-side reforms, because that's the one thing that ameliorates the otherwise tightening situation. But the, the um, Government Bank of England was setting out, I think, yesterday how difficult he sees the economy being. 
And this is a global problem, that there is a global inflation. It comes from globally loose money policy going back to 2008, and it comes from um, interruptions in supply chains from COVID. These, I think, the primary drivers. And then, of course, Ukraine on top of that. And I think we need to set out how difficult it is and then what we're doing to solve it so that people understand the decisions that are going to be made and, of course, can help in terms of retained EU law by saying, actually, if you do this, that makes life easier, that makes life more prosperous. So a really interesting three-pronged approach there. Monetary tightening, fiscal tightening and supply-side supply side reforms. reforms. And those supply-side reforms, which are more your purview than the other two areas, uh, have come under some criticism. Some people say that a lot of these regulations that you point to are trivial, that they don't really add up to all that much. What's your response to that criticism? A thousand trivial things make something quite substantial. But that's the point, that, that what the EU did was it strangled enterprise by thousands of pettifogging regulations, each one in and of itself minor, but cumulatively leading to a decline in economic growth and the prospects for economic growth. Thanks for that uh, to Tom. And just very quickly, Emma, I mean, I thought his comments on supply was very uh, interesting, supply chain, because we've been talking a lot about globalisation uh, since the pandemic and, and what's been happening in China and the fact that you can't get goods in. What's your take on what he had to say? I think that uh, in a rare case with, with this government and, and possibly at large with our institutions, this is a rare case of of this particular office being in very safe hands. I think mm. that Jacob rees morgs approach is absolutely right. I think he's right talking about the way that these minor, minor trivial things amount to something huge. And actually, if we are going to uh, engage globally, effectively, and that has political consequences and geopolitical consequences mm. as well, particularly with everything that's going on with China and Russia, I think that his his the plans that he sets out and, and Jacob rees morgs um, as an individual is absolutely the right man for the job. Yeah. Thanks for that. Well, I'm going to move on to a good news story now because the agency Purple Goat has been awarded uh, the Diversity and Inclusion Award for Company of the Year. And Purple Goat are a marketing agency company. They're focusing on using social uh, media tools to empower the disabled community. And joining me now is Dom Hymas. Uh, he's head of strategy at Purple uh, Goat. Hi, Dom. Good to see you. Hello, Darlene. How are you doing? Very nice to see you. I'm very well. And Dom, could you tell our listeners and viewers a little bit about your story and how you came to be involved in this agency and do what you're doing? Yeah, so my background originally was in TV production. Um, I was working on the Paralympics production in 2012 and 2016 as well in Rio. Um, and that was my kind of first place into the world of disability um, professionally and it was an amazing you know thing to be a part of I then worked across different digital media channels different marketing roles and eventually found myself at purple goat which is the most incredible organization that looks to really redefine representation in our media and and it's doing an amazing job of that and uh, Dom it's an interesting name for a company purple goat do you want to tell us how yeah. you came about uh, that name yeah, absolutely. So our sister agency is called GOAT, and it's one of the largest influencer agencies in the world. Um, and GOAT stands for greatest of all time in the kind of modern world. Um, and then purple is signified as the colour of disability, uh, particularly across the UK, but more and more globally, we're seeing that as the colour that represents disability. And, and how important is it, Dom, um, that people have role models within uh, the disabled community so that they know that they can achieve their potential and do whatever they want to do? I think you've, you've hit it on the head there. I think all too often the disabled community doesn't see people like themselves in advertising, in boardrooms, in society at large, where individuals genuinely can believe that they can be in that position. Um, you know, 0.06% of ads when taken across TV and beyond um, represent disability. And so that's a woeful kind of disproportionate amount of ads where we have 20% of the population that have some form of disability or impairment. You know, ultimately, you know, we need to see more disabled individuals um, where we want to be. And that gives aspiration and inspiration for individuals to know that they can do anything in their lives. 
And, and Dom, are things getting better? I mean, I get a sense that things are getting better, maybe not as fast as, as you would like to see, but things are getting better, aren't they? I think slowly but surely they are. I think that the pandemic, for everything that was horrible and negative about it, there was the understanding and realisation about those that shield, about you know, vulnerable individuals. We started to have conversations about disability that maybe we weren't having before. Um, and that has kind of ignited other knock-on conversations with, with brands, with big businesses, to start thinking about disability as part of diversity. All too often, we don't necessarily see disability included in that conversation, but now we're starting to have disability at the table as well, which is really, really important, considering it's that largest minority in the world. Yeah. And Dom, uh, finally, if there was one thing that you would uh, could make happen uh, uh, through advocacy, through your visibility, your awareness raising, what would that be? What would you do? I think, honestly, it would make more people more comfortable in and around disability. When people are comfortable, when people are confident to discuss disability, engage with disability, that only breeds opportunity um, for others. So if we're comfortable talking about disability, if we're comfortable engaging with it and asking the questions we need to ask, that will in turn push the whole movement forward um, a great deal. Well, Dom, you've helped that today by coming on the show. So thanks for coming on uh, and sharing uh, well your experiences uh, from Purple Goat. Emma, that's right, isn't it? I mean, we mm -hmm. need to be able to have these conversations so that people can feel more confident and comfortable. Absolutely. I, I was just thinking that when we talk about diversity, that is one of the most sensible things I have ever heard anyone yes, say, absolutely. is that it's about feeling comfortable because often the, the, the narrative, the discussions that we have around diversity makes people feel more uncomfortable. It makes people feel more alienated and therefore is very divisive. We saw this with you know, uh, race activism leading to polls suggesting that people felt more, uh, felt that it was more, the situation would become, become yes. more divisive. Um, and particularly, surrounding um, disability, it seems like a, a se such a sensible thing that I've never heard anyone say, which is that it is about making people feel comfortable and recognising that the, the sort of shared humanity and, the, and, and in, in a way um, encourages people not to be patronising towards people who have disabilities yeah. and therefore to, to um, ensure that they do have the opportunities that everybody else has. And that seems to me to be the most, uh, the most humane position that I've ever heard anybody express about diversity. And I think often people are afraid of saying the wrong thing, aren't they? So they just say mm -hmm. nothing yeah. instead of actually getting involved in a conversation mm -hmm. and, and finding out uh, about the lived experience of somebody that is disabled. And it must be one of the most, uh, I imagine that it must make uh, make it, an individual feel very uncomfortable yes. if they see that somebody else is feeling uncomfortable and that can surely only be aggravated by this feeling that you can't talk openly that you need to watch mm. your words that you need to be careful that actually if we if we change the to to, to to use a sort of turn of phrase try to change the conversation so that people do feel that they they can just you know speak openly and, and feel comfortable and relax a little that maybe actually more progress would be made yeah. Emma, thanks for joining me this afternoon. We've covered a lot of subjects uh, this afternoon, but you've been watching and listening to The Briefing with me, Arlene Foster, joined by Emma Webb. And this show's back every Friday from 3pm. And up next, it's Nana Aquia. Alex Deegan here with your latest weather update from the Met Office. More showers to come this weekend. But if you're after something drier, brighter and warmer. Next week looks reasonably promising, certainly across the southern half of the UK. For fine weather, we need high pressure to be sitting over us, but this low pressure is taking control through the weekend. It's not going to rain all weekend. Most of us will see some sunny spells. But as this weather system moves in, bringing some fairly heavy rain this evening across Northern Ireland, spreading into parts of southern and western Scotland. Ahead of that, across the east right now, some lively showers, but they do get pushed out into the North Sea as that weather front brings rain into Wales and western parts of England by dawn. Much of eastern England having a dry night once this evening's showers clear away and temperatures holding up in double digits. On to Saturday's weather, it's a bit of a mess. We start with a line of rain across Yorkshire, down through the Midlands, southeast Wales and southwest England. That slowly trickles eastwards. It doesn't really reach East Anglia in the southeast till late in the day, so mostly dry and bright here. Behind it, some sunny spells, but there will again be showers, staying fairly cloudy across much of Scotland through the day.